welcome back to the course on uh, computer network and uh, internet protocols. So, we are discussing about uh, the transport layer and uh, various services under the transport layer. So, uh, in the last class uh, we have discussed about uh, the basic uh, performance modules in the transport layer along with uh, a hypothetical transport layer protocol that uh, how will you interface the transport layer with the application layer. Uh, so, continuing from that point uh, in this lecture we will discuss about the buffer management mechanism in the transport layer and then we will look into the details of the congestion control algorithms. So, coming to the buffer management. So, uh, uh, as you have looked into the last class that uh, at the sender side as well as at the receiver side. Uh, we maintain a transport layer buffer which is a software buffer uh, maintained as a queue uh, and in that queue at the sender side whenever you are sending some data you put the data in that queue and then based on your rate control algorithm the transport layer will fetch the data from the queue and send it to the unreliable IP layer or the network layer. On the other hand at the receiver side uh, you have a queue where the data from the uh, from the network layer is put uh, into the queue and then the application will fetch the data from that queue. Now, uh, let us look into this diagram. So, uh, here uh, at the network layer this IP receive is again a hypothetical function that receive the data from the IP layer on the network layer and it put the data into the queue uh, and this queue is the buffer at the transport layer corresponds to an application and we use the port number uh, to identify that uh, in which buffer uh, you need to put the data. Uh, so, so uh, once this network layer put the data at the transport layer then the application uh, from the application you have to use the read system call or there are other system calls like the write system uh, the uh, write system call through which uh, you will uh, receive the data from the uh, transport layer. So, this read system call uh, which is a part of the socket programming that we will discuss later on uh, in details. Uh, so, the read using the read system call you will receive the data from the transport layer. So, if you are using this um, write call at the sender side then you can use the read call at the receiver side at the application to read the data. And uh, regarding this transport layer implementation as we have seen that this entire part of the implementation of the protocol stack that is implemented inside the kernel if you consider an uh, Unix type of operating system or broadly you can say that this uh, protocol stack is the part of the uh, operating system whereas, uh, this application is written in the user space. So, the frequency of the read call that is actually managed by the application which you are writing and the application is using this socket programming that we will discuss later in details. So, it will use the socket programming to read the data from this transport layer buffer. Now, it may happen that well uh, application is reading the data, data at one speed whereas, the network it is receiving the data at another speed. Many of the times it may happen that well uh, the network is uh, sending the data at a more higher speed compared to what the application is reading. Say so, maybe the network is uh, receiving data at a rate of some 1 Mbps and the application is reading the data at a rate of 10 Kbps. So, the application is reading the data at a rate of 10 Kbps means at that rate you are executing the read system call. So, you are uh, maybe coming at every 1 second and you are making a read system call with a uh, buffer size of 1 KB, uh, 10 KB. So, you will receive the data at a rate of 10 Kbps. Uh, because of this difference we face certain problems because uh, the data that will get buffered inside this transport buffer. So, uh, because you are receiving data at a higher rate. So, that particular data will get buffered inside uh, the transport layer buffer inside this particular queue and uh, after some time it may happen that the queue becomes full. If the queue becomes full that will be a problem uh, because in that case uh, uh, if the sender sends more data to the network then that particular data will come here at the transport layer, but because this buffer has become full uh, you will experience a packet drop from this particular buffer. Now, we want to avoid that. Now, to avoid that what you have to do uh, you have to tune the flow control algorithm. So, how will you tune the flow control algorithm? You have to have something 
called a dynamic buffer management where uh, this receiver buffer size it is changing dynamically it is changing dynamically because of this rate difference between the application layer and the transport layer at rate at the rate at which it is receiving the data from the network layer because of this rate difference um, you may face a problem you may ha have uh, dynamically changing buffer size now to handle that what you have to do like you have to send that information to the sender side so that sender can stop sending data unless there is sufficient space in the receiver buffer. So, this particular concept we call as the dynamic buffer management at the receiver side. So, let us look into this concept of dynamic uh, buffer management in uh, little details. Uh, so, uh, in case of dynamic buffer management uh, for window based flow control for sliding window based flow control, what you have to do that the sender and the receiver needs to dynamically adjust their buffer allocation. So, uh, that is based on the rate difference between the transport entity and the application uh, the available size of the receiver buffer may change. So, in this particular diagram, so these are the setup segments that the application has already read out. So, that has went uh, from the application buffer. Now, this is your complete buffer size well. So, this is your complete buffer size. Now, out of that there are three segments which are already there inside the buffer. So, these segments are waiting inside the buffer for the application to read them. Now, here the free space that you have in the receiver buffer that is this amount. So, you need to advertise this amount to the sender so that the sender does not send more data compared to what the receiver buffer can hold. So, the sender should not send more data compared to the receiver buffer space. So, you need to dynamically adjust the window size, the sender window size based on the availability of the receiver buffer space. So, what we have looked into the window based flow control algorithm that you can dynamically tune the sender window size and the sender window size basically depicts that how much data you can send to the receiver without waiting for the acknowledgement. Now, uh, if you send the feedback from the receiver side to the sender that well the receiver has this much of buffer space available, then the sender can set its window size to maximum that value. So, that it will never send data uh, to the receiver more than that particular size. Now, once the receiver will receive that data, uh, after receiving the data, the receiver can again send an acknowledgement once this data has been read by the application and when it is sending back the acknowledgement with the acknowledgement, it can announce the available buffer size. So, let us look how this particular procedure works. So, here is an example, there are two nodes A and B, uh, they are communicating with each other. So, the first message is that A request for 8 buffer. So, here we are representing buffer at the uh, number of segments that you want to transfer and we are assuming that every segment is of fixed size, although that does not hold true for TCP. But here this is just for simplification, we are making an assumption that every segment has of same size and uh, the receiver at uh, the sender, sender A. So, A is my sender who will send the data and B is my receiver who will receive the data. So, the sender first request for 8 buffer. So, A wants 8 buffer space from B, but B finds that well only 4 buffer space are available, buffer space for 4 segments are available. So, A sends back an acknowledgement with an acknowledgement number along with this buffer space value. So, the buffer space value is mentioned as 4 that determines that A will only grant three, 4 messages from message 0 to message 4 or from segment 0 to segment 4. Now, uh, A sends 1 message. So, once A sends this uh, message, this data uh, with sequence number 0, uh, now at this time A has sent 1. So, A has 3 buffers left, then A sends another message M1, now A has 2 buffers left. Uh, then A has sent another message and assume that this message has lost. Now, this message has lost. Uh, so, although at the receiver side you have 2 buffer space left, but A thinks that there are only 1 buffer space left because A has already sent uh, 3 segments. So, at this stage B acknowledges 0 and 1. So, once B acknowledges in 0 and 1, A say, B sends an acknowledgement 1. So, here this acknowledgement is a cumulative acknowledgement. So, once you are sending back acknowledgement 1, that means you are acknowledge, acknowledging both uh, message 0 and message 1. Along with that, it is advertising that the buffer space is 3. So, you get an update that well, this message 0 and message 1 has been successfully received by the receiver and uh, it has a available buffer space of 3. So, um, 
A again sends message M3 because it has uh, sent message M2 already. Um, it has sent message um, um, M2 already, so um, it doesn't know that uh, whether the message has been received or not. Then it again sends M4 and uh, finally sends M2. So after sending this three, um, it it the advertised buffer space was three, so it has sent three message. So once it is it has sent three message during that time. Uh, a cannot send any more data because a sending window was set to 3. So, it has already transmitted 3, uh, uh, three messages. Now, at this stage, um, uh, this uh, B, uh, it sends an acknowledgement saying that acknowledgement number equal to 4. So, when this acknowledgement number is equal to 4, uh, at this stage, uh, A finds out that well, all the 4 messages starting from uh, M1 uh, starting from M2, M3 and M4, they got acknowledged because 4 is again a cumulative acknowledgement. So, at this stage there was a timeout for uh, there was a timeout for message M2 for which it has not received the acknowledgement and it transmits that message again. So, B has received M2, M3 and N4. So, B has sent an acknowledgement 4 with buffer space 0. So, with this buffer space 0, uh, what A is acknowledging? The A is acknowledging that uh, uh, that this particular message, all the message has been received by B, but it does not have any buffer space available. That means, the application has not read that data. Now, once the application has read that data, A sends another acknowledgement um, saying that the acknowledgement number, the same acknowledgement number 4, but announcing the buffer space as 1. So, at this stage A makes one buffer space available, B makes one buffer space available to A saying that it can send one more message, one more segment. So, here you can see that once you are advertising buffer space 0, after that once uh, that buffer space becomes available, you need to send another, um, another acknowledgement, otherwise the sender will get blocked at this stage because the sender once it gets that the buffer space is 0, it will not send any more data. So, it is it will get blocked there. So, that way the things gets continuous uh, continued. Uh, so, here in this case uh, a, a sends the data and gets blocked and then um, uh, it, it gets an acknowledgement number with buffer space 0, uh, here a is still blocked, uh, then a, a can send uh, get, get another message. Uh, with the available buffer space. So, here uh, you can see that well uh, it may it may sometime happen that uh, uh, that uh, because of you are sending this advertisement that uh, uh, that uh, you have do not you do not have any sufficient buffer space there is a po possible possible deadlock at the uh, sender side because the sender can find out or sender can think of that no more space is available at the receiver side. Now, to avoid this particular thing, what you have to ensure? You have to ensure that the acknowledgements are flowing in the network continuously. So, uh, in, in this particular example, if it happens that well, uh, initially you have advertised that the buffer space is 0, then B sends another acknowledgement saying that the buffer space is available, but somehow this acknowledgement got lost. So, because this acknowledgement got lost, uh, the system can lead to a deadlock unless uh, B sends another acknowledgement after it gets a timeout. Um, uh, so, it need to explicitly tell uh, to A that uh, now uh, sufficient buffer space is available. So, A will be able to send more data. So, in that particular case, you have to ensure that after every timeout, we should if B is not receiving any more data from A and the connection is still open, so B should send the duplicate acknowledgement announcing that it has sufficient buffer space to uh, receive further data. Otherwise, there is a possibility of uh, having a deadlock in case the acknowledgement get lost. Well, so this is the concept of uh, dynamic buffer management uh, at the transport layer. Now, uh, we will see another uh, important aspect of the transport layer which we call as the congestion control. So, what is that congestion control? So, you just initially think of a centralized network scenario. So, each node has an edge, there is an edge between two nodes and we have an edge weight. So, this edge weight signifies that 
what is the capacity of that particular link. Say uh, if you want to send some data from S to D at that case if you want to find out that what would be the capacity of that flow, what would be the maximum capacity of that flow. So, you can apply this max flow mean cut theorem which is being covered in the algorithmic course. So, you can apply the max flow mean cut theorem and from the max flow mean cut theorem you can, you can find out uh, what is the minimum cut here. So, uh, just by looking uh, into the scenario this uh, seems to be the minimum cut because this is the minimum cut. Uh, so, you can send um, a maximum flow at a rate of uh, 6 plus 4 plus 10 plus 2 12. So, you can send data at a rate of if we send the think of the unit as Mbps. So, you can send the data at a rate of 12 Mbps from S to D. Now, if you have this kind of centralized scenario, uh, you can apply uh, this kind of algorithm, this kind of mechanism to restrict your flow rate to 12 Mbps. But if it is not there, if it is not there, then how will you be able to find it? Now, your flow control algorithm will not be able to guarantee that your transmission is always restricted to 12 Mbps because you are getting the rate from multiple paths and um, the thing is restricted to this maximum segment size that is an approximate calculation uh, that we have looked earlier. Uh, so, because of that it may happen that in a distributed scenario the sender may push more data compared to this 12 Mbps bottleneck capacity which is there in this particular network. So, this capacity is the bottleneck capacity. So, if you want to send some data from S to D even if there are no other flows in the network you will never be able to achieve more than 12 Mbps. Now, the scenario get more complicated uh, if you have multiple flows. If you think of that there is another flow from this say S1 to D1 that will also use this uh, links these individual links in the network you can think of that there is a link from here to here uh, with a capacity of 4. Now, it will use this particular link. Now, this flow may go, go through any of this link and there would be this kind of overlapping among multiple end to end flows and they will share the capacity in this uh, bottleneck links. So, this entire thing uh, is difficult to implement in a real network because in a real network uh, you have to implement it in a distributed way. So, in that particular concept the congestion may occur in the network where this bottleneck link uh, in the bottleneck link you are trying to push more than the capacity of that particular bottleneck link. Now, if you want to uh, push more data compared to the bottleneck link uh, uh, per capacity of the bottleneck link what will happen that the intermediate buffer at the nodes they will get filled up you will experience packet loss which will reduce the end to end transmission delay or which, which will increase the end to end transmission delay significantly. So, from here uh, let us look into that uh, how your bandwidth changes when you uh, allocate start more flows between the same source destination pair. So, initially say uh, your bandwidth allocation we are normalizing it in 1 Mbps. So, initially if you have a single flow so, we just think of a network like this. So, you have say this network and uh, you are you are sending a single flow from this source to S1 to destination D1 and assume that this bottleneck link capacity is 1 Mbps. Now, if that is the case then once you are starting flow 1 then flow 1 will be able to use this entire uh, 1 Mbps bandwidth which is there in this bottleneck link. Now, say after some time at one second you start another flow from say this S2 to D2. This is let say flow 2. Now, if you start that then uh, this link capacity is 1 Mbps. So, this link is being shared by both F1 and F2. So, ideally what should happen that well uh, whenever you are starting this particular flow uh, it will it will uh, the entire bandwidth the bottleneck bandwidth will be divided between F1 and F2. So, everyone will get approximately both flow 1 and flow 2 will get approximately uh, 0.5 Mbps of speed uh, if they are sending rate is more than 0.5 Mbps. Uh, so, in that case uh, this entire bottleneck capacity is divided between flow 1 and flow 2 and after some time say you have started another flow 
flow 3, which has required, which, uh, whose required bandwidth is little less, say its required bandwidth is something close to say 100 kbps. If that is the case, it will drag this 100 kbps bandwidth from here and then the remaining bandwidth will be shared between flow 1 and flow 2 and flow 1 and flow 2 are utilizing both this bottleneck bandwidth. Now, after some time if flow 2 stops, then flow 1 say flow 2 gets stops, flow 2 flow 2 finishes at that time flow 1 will get the bandwidth um, which is uh, close to 900, uh, 900 kbps and uh, flow 1 is utilizing some 100 kbps. That way this entire bandwidth allocation among multiple, multiple flows gets changed over time. So, in this context, uh, the congestion we discussed the congestion control algorithm in the network. Uh, so, this congestion control algorithm it is required because these flows they enter and exit network dynamically, the example that we have seen. And because of this reason, applying an algorithm for congestion control in the network is difficult because you do not have the centralized network information like the first example that I have shown you where you can apply this mean cut theorem to find out the maximum flow between uh, one source and one destination. Uh, the scenario is much more difficult here because every individual router do not have this entire network information, even the end host do not have that entire network information and a distributed or in a decentralized way you have to uh, allocate the flows among uh, flow rates among different end to end flows. So, we apply something called a congestion avoidance algorithm rather than a congestion control because a priori estimation of congestion is difficult. Uh, so, rather than going for congestion control, we go for congestion avoidance. So, the congestion avoidance says that whenever there is a congestion, you detect that congestion and then try to come out of that congestion. So, how will you do that? So, you regulate the sending rate based on what the network can support. So, your sending rate now is the minimum of something called the network rate and the receiver rate. So, al earlier your sending rate was equal to the receiver rate. So, based on the buffer advertisement that was uh, given by the receiver, you are controlling your window size and you are sending the data at that particular rate. Now, your sending rate will be the minimum of your network rate, what the network can support and what the receiver can support. So, this network rate, uh, receiver rate, it comes from the flow control algorithm. So, the it comes from the receiver advertised window size for a sliding window based flow control. So, the receiver is advertising that particular window information and this network rate, uh, you do not have any control over the network rate or rather to say you do not have any estimation mechanism over the network rate. So, what you can do that you can gradually increase this network rate component and observe the effect on the flow rate. So, uh, ideally what can happen in case of wired network if you assume that the loss due to channel error is very less. That means, if there is a loss from the network, that loss is coming due to the buffer overflow at the intermediate routers. Now, if buffer overflow happens, that gives an indication that well, the total incoming rate to that buffer exceeds the total outgoing rate from that buffer. So, as an example, if you just think of an uh, intermediate buffer, uh, intermediate buffer Q, it is receiving data from multiple flows and there is some outgoing rate, uh, the outgoing rate can also be multiple. So, assume that total incoming rate is lambda and total outgoing rate is mu. Now, if your lambda is more than mu, this indicates that after some time the buffer will get filled up and once the buffer will get filled up, there will be packet drop from the buffer and you will experience a loss. Now, if you observe a packet loss here, that indicates that the total incoming rate to the intermediate buffer is exceeding from the total outgoing rate that means, lambda is more than mu. So, this gives a signature of the congestion that means, if you just think of a road network say assume that you have a road network something like this. So, this is an example road network. So, the cars are coming through these roads. So, this is the bottleneck here. So, say here the total capacity that it can support if the total incoming capacity from these two roads are exceeding this capacity. So, you will experience a congestion here. 
So, the same thing happens in case of network and we are uh, sensing a congestion from this packet loss because packet loss gives an indication that the buffer that you have uh, that buffer is getting exceeded. So, uh, you, you identify it as a congestion and you again drop the network rate. So, the broad idea is that you gradually uh, increase the network rate at some time you will experience a packet loss. The moment you are experiencing a loss then you drop the rate and again increase the rate and again whenever you will get a loss you will drop the rate. So, that way we apply the congestion control algorithm in the network. Now, the question comes here that how will you increase the rate. So, we see the first we want to see the impact of network congestion over good put and delay. So, what we see that uh, if you look into the network good put that the number of packets per second that you are receiving at the transport layer and with the offered load. So, you have a maximum capacity. So, normally what happens that well uh, the rate gets increased up to the maximum capacity, but at the moment there is this congestion you see a sudden drop in the good put because your packets are getting dropped and if packets are getting dropped the flow control algorithm will try to retransmit the packets. So, you will get a sudden drop here we call that as the congestion collapse. Now, when the con congestion collapse happens you experience a significant increase in the delay because packets are getting dropped the flow control is trying to retransmit the packet if at that time the link is not able to come out of the congestion again that retransmitted packet will fall in the congestion and there is a high probability that the buffer is still full and the packet may get dropped. So, because of that the total end to end delivery of the successful packet that may get increased. Now, uh, so uh, to ensure congestion control over the network we need to ensure another thing which we call as the fairness. So, what is fairness? The fairness ensures that the rate of all the flows in the network is controlled in a fair way. What do what do, does it mean, mean that? Now, uh, a bad congestion control algorithm may affect fairness that means some flows in the network may get starved. Uh, so, because because it is flowing in the congestion so you can just think of a scenario in a road network if you are falling in a congestion if a car is falling in a congestion so the car can have a very bad luck or have a huge delay to reach at the destination. So, the similar thing may happen in the network that some flows may get starved. Now, in a decentralized network ensuring hard fairness is very difficult because uh, you again you require the entire uh, network information and want to do some mathematical calculation to find out this uh, mean cut from that mean cut theorem that what would be the uh, available capacity and restrict the bandwidth to that particular capacity. So, uh, doing all this calculation of us on a central network is very hard. So, rather than providing this kind of hard fairness what we try to do we try to allocate what is called as a maximum fairness. So, what is a maximum fairness? So, an allocation is maximum fair if the bandwidth given to one flow cannot be increased without decreasing the bandwidth given to another flow with an allocation. So, that means in an allocation say you have two flows say lambda 1 lambda 2 we can say that this lambda 1 lambda 2 is maximum fair if if you make lam increase lambda 1 to some value epsilon then you have to decrease lambda 2. So, lambda 2 need to be decreased. So, you cannot increase the value of lambda 1 without decreasing the value of lambda 2. This particular allocation we call it as a maximum fair allocation. So, let us look into an example of maximum fair allocation. So, in this particular example we have multiple flows here. So, you can see that this is the bottleneck capacity uh, where three flows are sharing the link. So, three flows are sharing the links means each of them will get one third of the bandwidth. So, this particular link is shared by maximum number of flows. So, this is shared by three flows, this is shared by two flows, this is shared by two flows and this is shared by one flow. So, here uh, is the bottleneck. So, each of them will get one third of the bandwidth. If they are getting one third of the bandwidth the flow which is uh, this flow number D uh, it will use one third of the bandwidth, this flow number C it will use one third of the bandwidth. Then flow B which is moving from uh, here uh, because of this bottleneck capacity it is using one third of bandwidth. So, it will utilize one third of bandwidth in this link. So, in this link the remaining capacity is two third. So, this flow A it can use two third of the bandwidth. So, this is a maximum fair algorithm because if you want to increase the bandwidth of this from, from one third say for flow 
B if you want, want to increase it from one third you have to decrease the bandwidth of uh, flow A. Similarly, if you want to increase the bandwidth for flow C or flow D because you can see that in this link uh, the total uh, capacity that is being utilized two third it is not utilizing the full capacity. Here also it is not utilizing the full capacity and just by thinking that if you want to increase the capacity of any of this link because of this bottleneck capacity distribution you have to decrease the capacity of say flow B. So, this particular allocation is a maximum fear allocation. Now, in a distributed way uh, we can we can ensure maximum fear allocation by applying this AIMD algorithm. So, we call it the algorithm as additive increase multiplicative decrease which was proposed by C. Wang Jane in 1989. So, the algorithm is something like this. So, you increase the flow rate additively, but drop the flow rate uh, multiplicatively. What is mean by that? So, let W t be the sending rate and A is an additive increase factor and B is an multiplicative decrease factor. So, whenever you are uh, increasing the rate that means the congestion is not detected you provide an additive component, but when congestion is decre decremented you provide a multiplicative component. So, the value of B is from 0 to 1. So, if you are multiplying by B that means you are dropping the rate. So, the example of additive increase multiplicative decrease is that say you increase it linearly in additive way uh, say adding a fixed component uh, uh, whenever you are increasing, but whenever you are dropping you make a significant drop. Now, let us see that how this additive increase multiplicative decrease. So, this part is the additive increase and this part is the multiplicative decrease. So, how this additive increase multiplicative decrease can help in ensuring fairness. Now, let us look into another variant which we call as the AIAD or MIMD. So, AIAD is the additive increase additive decrease you increase additively as well as decrease additively. MIMD is you increase multiplicatively as well as you decrease multiplicatively. So, we are taking an example of two users who are sharing the bottleneck link. Now, if two users are sharing the bottleneck link, so this line gives you the fairness because this line with a 45 degree uh, uh, slope uh, it says you that well if you take one point here that both user A and user B gets almost equal amount of bandwidth or in hard fairness they get equal amount of bandwidth. So, this line gives me the fairness line. Similarly, this line gives you the efficiency line because here the total allocation has reached to 100 percent. Now, if you start from this point and with this additive increase if you increase the bandwidth once you exceed this line that means you are putting more data than the capacity of the link this 100 percent bandwidth link. So, you will experience a packet loss that means the notion of the congestion. Now, at this case if you want to decrease the bandwidth in an additive way you just decrease it parallelly. So, you can see that if you are doing additive increase and additive decrease you will just oscillate around this uh, efficiency line, but that is not the optimal point we want something here this is the optimal point where both the flows will get 50 percent of the 50 percent of the available bandwidth and together they will on the efficiency line that means at the 100 percent. So, we want to reach at this point. So, in additive increase additive decrease you will just oscillate on the efficiency line. Similarly, on the multiplicative increase and multiplicative decrease you will oscillate on the um, uh, this efficiency line because you will increase in the same rate and drop in the same rate. But if you are going for additive increase multiplicative decrease the scenario becomes something like this. So, the scenario becomes something like this. So, you, you are you are starting from this point you are making an additive increase then you make a multiplicative decrease then again you make a additive increase you make a multiplicative decrease you make a additive increase and a multiplicative decrease. So, gradually you will move towards the optimal point. So, if you are making as an additive increase followed by a multiplicative decrease again additive increase followed by a multiplicative decrease and both the users are following this principle gradually they will come to the optimal point. Similarly, if you start from here you make a additive increase then towards this center point make a multiplicative decrease again make a additive increase make a multiplicative decrease gradually you will move towards this optimal point. So, that way this AIMD algorithm additive increase up 
at 45 degree and multiplicative decrease towards the line points to origin, if you apply this particular algorithm, you can converge towards the optimal point. So, uh, this particular algorithm is used by TCP to adjust the size of the sliding window to control the rates that we will look into the details uh, sometime later. Well, uh, so in this particular lecture, you got a broad overview about the congestion control algorithm and uh, with this lecture, we have uh, covered basic services which are uh, being offered at the transport layer. So, in the next set of lectures, we will look into more details of the transport layer from the protocol perspective and also we will look into that how these different services can be combined together to build up the final service set. Uh, so, thank you all for attending, hope we will meet in the next class.